Kena naskom tenoa kahkia o kiteyak, o gimawak, iskoyak napeyak o skayak. Ano tsmi o kiskawa no tawin ans mantu o kena naskom ten. In Cree, friends and relatives, uh, I'm very happy to be here acknowledging the, the elders, the men, the women, the chiefs, the young people, the youth, acknowledging our Creator for this beautiful day. And as well in Nakota as well, Humatakia pi Pinamaya, Antukashla Pinamaya. A little Nakota because we're also Cree Assiniboine back on Little Black Bear. Um, we always start with that to make sure that we never lose that focus on the, in the importance of our languages. Again this morning, we look towards and we lift up uh, the Algonquin peoples, the Algonquin nation, for hosting us on their traditional lands. And for Elder Josie, for her prayers this morning and her words of wisdom, but as well, more importantly, for the water ceremony this morning. We thank her for that, that good teaching and about the importance and the relevancy of water because it is life for our people. And as well to our elders' council, Chief Elmer Kushane, Elder El Elder Elmer Kushane, for leading us in the pipe ceremony, in his words of counsel as well. Nista, my friends, again, I'll acknowledge not only the elders' chair, Elmer Kershane, the women's council chair and deputy grand chief, Denise Stonefish, the youth council's chairs, Andre Bear, Andre Bear and Jennifer Obamsuin, to the chiefs, the grand chiefs, hereditary chiefs, mothers, friends, colleagues, citizens of our nations. Minister Bennett, thank you for being here as well. My colleagues on the executive, all the regional chiefs, we always acknowledge them because we're really coming together. And you might think we have disagreements, we do, but we always find that common ground and respect. And I acknowledge and lift them all up for their courage and for their efforts to make a difference for our people. Again, we acknowledge the Algonquin Nation. jean -Guy, very good words, Chief jean -Guy. Always about title and rights. Always putting that at the forefront, making a difference for our people. I want to acknowledge and say today as well, today is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, also known as White Ribbon Day. And today we remember the victims of the 1989 Ecole Polytechnique massacre. We remember the lives that were taken that day. And as First Nations, we remember and honor the many, the far too many missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and their families. It is a stark reminder of the work we have to do to ensure safety and security for First Nations women families and children. And that's why we're here. That's what our priorities are about. And we must remember that in all of our discussions over the next few days, that that's the focus of our energies. It has been one year since our last Special Chiefs Assembly. One year since I pledged to you as your National Chief to work with the AFN, all the regional chiefs, and all of you to ensure Canada's new government keeps its promise of a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship based on recognition of rights, respect, cooperation, and partnership. And as we approach the year's end, let us take stock of the accomplishments we will build upon and note the areas where more work and greater progress is needed. Because over the past year, the Assembly of First Nations has been focused on ensuring progress for our people and for you as chiefs as we work to close the gap and improve the quality of life for our peoples. We forge new relationships with federal governments, provincial governments, municipal governments, international and indigenous leaders, and other partners. We've joined tables on health care, climate change, the environment, and on human rights both nationally and internationally. And we've initiated tables, tables to lead the new way to a new fiscal relationship with the Crown to establish long-term, sustainable, predictable funding. We've initiated a new way to approach specific claims. Even that word claims, we're going to start changing that word. 
We shouldn't have to claim anything back as indigenous peoples. When you start looking at rights and title, and how we're to mutually benefit from sharing the land and resource wealth. Following the upcoming First Minister's meeting, we also want to be able to respond that there's a new way to deal to climate change. We've established a new protocol with the RCMP. We have re-established the Chiefs Committee on Languages, and we brought back our First Nations veterans again, showing them that we're committed to help them deal with their issues as First Nations veterans right across this land. We've held housing and infrastructure forums, urban forums for First Nations people living in cities, because we know 50% of our people reside off our territories and communities. We put on an energy forum that brought together people from all across the spectrum for dialogue, seeking the balance between the economy and our environment, and sustainable economic development strategies, as we respect the land and waters. So last week, the government announced it would proceed with the Kinder Morgan and Line 3 initiatives and would not go ahead with the Northern Gateway project. And tomorrow at our energy dialogue session, we will be hearing from people with differing positions, those chiefs that have satisfied themselves and their people that for their First Nation, the proposed development can be managed in a sustainable, an environmentally responsible way. And we have also heard from chiefs who are concerned that in their case, for their territories, that the risks are too great. We want to facilitate that respectful dialogue that may lead to a better understanding of why some First Nations are saying yes and some are saying no. We support rights. As AFN, we're not the rights and title holders. We support rights. And the most important right that we will support is that right to self-determination. And I've always said that means the right to say yes and the right to say no. Make no mistake, regardless of the position that anyone takes, we know that we all make decisions with the best interests of our people in mind, not only now, but for future generations. We talk about seven generations of Tinigan in the future. We can all agree on one thing, and that is the world we live in today it is far too dependent on fossil fuels. And the way forward is for all of us globally is to move towards a future based on cleaner, greener, renewable energy. And there will be a lot of jobs as well when we start making that transition. And there will be also respect for the land and water when we see that clear phase and path forward. But there has to be a transition. Climate change is certainly one of the greatest issues of our time. And as indigenous peoples with our way of life, our people live closest to the land. We are often the first to feel the effects of climate change. And we know we have a leadership role to play in the fight for future generations. Just look at what was accomplished down south with our Dakota brothers and sisters down at Standing Rock. And I know many of us have lent support there. We sent our emissary down on behalf of the AFN, Chief Hart from Manitoba. Different regional chiefs have gone down. Different chiefs have gone down. Sending your energy, your commitment, your love, even financial resources. Chiefs have made lar large commitments to the Standing Rock peoples. And what happened? The power of prayer the power of ceremony, that there will be an alternative route looked after. So we can say it was a victory there, but we must be vigilant. And we know there are other, more immediate crises in many of our First Nations. Some chiefs have faced natural disasters, floods, fires, shootings, and the most tragic of all, the suicide crisis amongst our little ones. Communities in northern Ontario, northern Manitoba, northern Saskatchewan, where children as young as 10 years of age, they felt so hopeless, they took their lives. So we remember today and every day as we gather and we talk about the economy and we talk about energy and we talk about the environment and we talk about education and the need for change. 
no matter what we are doing, we have to remember that the heart of our, at the heart of our fight, the fight for a brighter future for our children and grandchildren, is the key. Everything we do must be about our children and grandchildren. Another teaching from Elder Krishan, do not forget the children, because they are waiting. They are waiting right now for us to make progress. And that is why we work on all these things every day. And at this time last year, we were building on our Closing the Gap, the gap platform. Closing the gap in the quality of life between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. We were advocating that the new government make significant investments in housing, clean water, education, healthcare, infrastructure. Those things that will make a real difference in the quality of life for our people. So come budget day in March, $8.4 billion was announced. And I took that message out across Canada. And I said it this way. When was the last time there was $8.4 billion allocated for Indigenous peoples? Never. It's better than Kelowna, over five years, no question. But I've also said we're not doing cartwheels and flips right now, totally. Because we've got to get the resources out. And they are flowing. We just want to say we've got to be more effective and efficient and work in partnership to find more effective mechanisms so that they get out to have real meaningful impact on the grounds, out to your territories and communities. So we're, that's the work we have to do in partnership. How can we make it more effective and efficient? Find ways where there are stumbling blocks and roadblocks and try to find creative ways around them so that those resources get out and have a real meaningful impact. Because we say continually there are investments in human capital. And when you invest in the fastest growing segment of Canada's population, which is young First Nations men and women, you'll have huge returns on investments in the future. In fact, over a 20-year period, we've said these numbers, that if investments were made a few years back, over a 20-year period, $400 billion would be added to Canada's GDP. And $125 billion would be saved in social spending. So we have to look at long-term, sustainable investments to close that gap. A year ago, the Prime Minister came here, and he joined us right where we are today. And he responded to our Closing the Gap document. We shared that document with all the parties to influence their platforms before the election. And he made five commitments to your chiefs here. He's going to be with us this afternoon, and we'll hear from him again. And I thought it would be good just to kind of take stock of what happened over the last year, and where were those five commitments at? A year later, what's transpired? So last year when he was here, he announced there would be an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. So a year ago, the federal government responded to the calls of family members and friends and many advocates, including the Assembly of First Nations, when it announced a national inquiry into the tragedy of more than 1,300 missing and murdered indig Indigenous women and girls. Since that time, the Assembly of First Nations has participated in a series of national roundtables, provided a pre-inquiry report based on the AFN forum held in Edmonton this April, and five commissioners have been appointed led by Chief Commissioner, the Honorable Marion Buller of Mistawasis First Nation. And this fall, on behalf of the families, I wrote to Commissioner Buller and to the ministers responsible for the inquiry, calling for a response to concerns over a lack of communication. We need, to more, need more information about the status of the inquiry. Hundreds of people have been waiting for years for, the work, for this inquiry to begin to know what the work that's being undertaken, and they should not have to wait any longer for information. And I've said this as well. We don't have to wait for two years for the inquiry to come up with their recommendations. Federal governments, provincial governments, municipal governments, the big cities, our own people can make investments in transportation, in daycare, in wellness centers, in detox centers, safe shelters, the things that the women need 
to make sure that that situation ends. So we don't have to wait two years. So we're going to keep urging all levels of government to work together, to make investments now, set up the appropriate secretariats to make sure that that work is corresponding, that there is follow-up every step of the way. So we don't have to wait. But we have invited them here to come provide an information update, if you will, to the Chiefs and Assembly. And so we'll hear from that a little earlier on today. The situation in Val d'Or, it's yet another reminder that the justice system and the policing system continues to discriminate against First Nations and that racial and gender bias are real problems that must be addressed. I lift up the Mayor of Val d'Or, Gislain Picard, for his hard efforts and work supporting the women there. We stand with the courageous women who came forward with their stories. We support their calls for an independent investigation into the situation, which is simply wrong. And the message to those brave women that came forward is simple. We believe you. We believe you. And so moving forward, how do we bring about that change? The Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, the second item, 94 calls to action will be honored and implemented. Nearly a year ago, the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was released, and Canada committed to acting on all 94 calls to action. And the foundation of these measures in those 94 calls to action is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's one of the 94 calls to action. The UN Declaration provides the right framework for reconciliation, and it supports the full implementation of inherent and treaty rights. It supports the full implementation of not only those rights, but title and jurisdiction. And the Prime Minister recognizes this. At the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in New York in May, Canada committed to working in full partnership with Indigenous peoples to implement the UN Declaration. It's time to take the next step, to move to a joint process to plan all implementation measures, and we are ready to move. It's time to embrace the Declaration as a set of human rights standards that must guide decision-making and the rebuilding of relationships. This is really the path to peace and true reconciliation. Speaking in New York in May, Minister Bennett said, it means nothing less than a full engagement on how to move forward with adoption and implementation done in full partnership with First Nations, the Métis Nation, and Inuit peoples. This sends a strong message to all Canadians that the era of forced assimilation is ending, a new era of respect, recognition, and partnership is beginning, and to ensure it takes hold, we must explore all options, including legislation. That's the key message, including legislation, to ensure that progress we have fought so hard for, once realized, can never be taken away. That is why the Assembly of First Nations has been working diligently towards the establishment of a joint ministerial working group to oversee the development of a plan to make progress on those 94 calls to action real. We strongly believe that there must be regular monitoring of progress with our full involvement, and that is why I wrote to the Prime Minister, following our last July Assembly, to say that no decisions on how to adopt and implement the Declaration should be taken without the full and effective participation of First Nations peoples, and that all options must be considered together as partners, including legislation. The third piece, the 2% funding cap and a new fiscal agreement with the Crown, that was talked about. And I remember the Chief stood in standing ovation, all these announcements. 20 years you have lived with that cap. 20 years, no growth, doesn't keep up with inflation, it's not based on total population, no support in O&M and band support funding. It's a cap on growth, it's a cap on potential. So the 2% cap would be removed and that a new fiscal relationship would be embarked on with the Crown, working towards long-term sustainable predictable funding. 
So last December, we secured the Prime Minister's commitment to eliminate that 2% funding cap. And we know a cap that's been in place for 20 years. It's handicapping potential and crippling our ability to provide a bright future for our people. And in July, we did sign a Memorandum of Understanding with Minister Bennett and INAC, Indigenous Northern Affairs Canada, to begin the process of building a new relationship with the Government of Canada, the Crown, that respects our inherent Aboriginal treaty rights, a new fiscal relationship that's based on total population for funding, one based on meeting the real needs, and one that keeps up with inflation. A relationship that respects your role as governments, and one that supports the delivery of effective and efficient programs and services, and recognizes that First Nations governments are accountable to their people first and foremost. One that delivers, in the Prime Minister's words to you last year, sufficient, predictable, and sustained funding. So not only did we see that $8.4 billion in the last budget, it's an overall increase of 22%, but we have seen escalators of 4.5% on kindergarten or grade 12 education. That is a clear step forward in erasing the damage done over 20 years. The 2% cap has been a cap on growth and development. Funding for our core programs has been capped as well. But all these good things doesn't mean that our work is complete. Far from it. There are still 40,000 children in care. And their needs cannot wait. The government agreed with an all-party motion that called for Canada to comply with Jordan's principle and for equitable support for First Nations children living on reserve I pressed the premiers on this issue last July when we met in Haines Junction in the Yukon. And they all agreed to make this their priority. And yesterday, the first meeting of the National Advisory Committee on Child Welfare was held. And they will drive the total reform of the First Nations Child and Family Services Program to address trial welfare funding issues, improving outcomes for families, decreasing the number of children in care, and restore jurisdiction in recognition of First Nations child well-being laws. I've always said that you can occupy the field. So if you don't want the federal laws to apply to you, and if you don't want the Provincial Child Welfare Act to apply to you, create your own First Nations Child and Family Services Act and occupy the field and exert jurisdiction, not only on reserve, but off reserve as well. That's the work that has to begin. We expect to see the funding gap in child welfare closed very soon in the upcoming budgets. And there are other investments we will be looking for that were not part of last year's federal budget. Investments in post-secondary education to eliminate the waiting lists and close the tuition gap. Investments in other core services like band support funding for the administration of your offices. Operations and maintenance on capital. And income assistance as well. And we will work to ensure that future escalators on all programs and services are based on the sufficient, predictable, and sustainable funding promised by the Prime Minister. I also want to acknowledge the work of my co-chair on the Chief's Committee on Fiscal Relations, Chief Jimmy, who's helping to make sure the important work is getting done. I lift up Minister Bennett for your work at that table because over the last few months, she's been at the meetings. She's been supporting the work. I also want to acknowledge the work of the, the chiefs that sit on the fiscal relations because over the past six months they've been diligent. And I also want to recognize Mr. Scott Bryson, the President of Treasury Board, for his participation at our last fiscal chiefs table meeting because we can't just deal with one department. It's with the Crown and Treasury Board is a key institution of the Crown that need to be involved as we work towards the long-term, sustainable, predictable funding that we need and want. Because I know how it is at the band level. You sign an agreement with INAC, you sign a contribution agreement, or an AFA, or FTP, then you sign another one with Health and Wealth for, for NADA, then you sign another one for ESDC for daycares, and you have a policing agreement, you sign another one with another police department, Ralph Goodale's department, so it's transcending these departments. We're trying to work towards a one agreement model, but based on a nation-to-nation -nation transfer. So we are exploring new transfer mechanisms to replace the short-term, narrowly defined contribution agreements we've been working under. 
And that's going to take time. Education was the other commitment. The importance of First Nations education. And we know that's the best way out of poverty. And so when the Prime Minister talked about that, he said, we can't afford to wait. So come March, the federal budget made an historic investment in First Nations priorities, $8.4 billion, yes, including $2 billion for First Nations education, money that came without the imposition of legislation, instead respecting the need for First Nations control of First Nations education. Our advocacy efforts are now focused on Budget 2017 and realizing additional investments to eliminate the post-secondary wait lists and ensure that every First Nation person can realize their potential through college, university, vocational programs, and apprenticeships in the trades. But we've always said this. Our young people walk in both worlds. And we need two systems of education. Strong on math and science. Strong on literacy and numeracy. Yes, great kindergarten or grade 12, on to university and technical vocational training. Equally as important, our old people always tell us, are your languages and your ceremonies and your customs and traditions on the other hand. You need both to walk in balance. Our children walk in both worlds. So you need both. Not too much of one or the other, but in balance. So when we talk about a good education, it's the two systems that our people will spring for and keep pushing forward. Walking in balance. That was the education piece. The fifth one, a federal law and policy review. Throughout the past year, we've advocated for a fulsome federal law and policy review to be conducted in partnership with First Nations to address all the laws and the policies imposed by past governments that really systematically deny us our inherent rights, title, and jurisdiction. So I've always said, you've got the judicial branch saying one thing, the Supreme Court of Canada is saying one thing, recognition of rights and title, treaties, Aboriginal rights. We're winning over 200 Supreme Court decisions. The legislative and the executive branch of government do not keep up in, with time of what's being said over here on the judicial branch. So that's why we really need to push this law and policy review. All those laws are outdated. Bill C-51, C-38, C-45, C-27, C-26, C-10, S-3, they're all outdated. And they're, they don't recognize rights and title. It's all based on termination of rights and title. And the same goes with the policies of comprehensive claims and spec claims and additions to reserve and the inherent right to self-government are all based on termination, not recognition of rights and title. So this is a key area we've got to move and get the legislative and the executive branch of government caught up with what the judicial branch is saying. That's the work going forward. Those laws and policies originally written to deny us and terminate our rights have to be reviewed with our full involvement. And they have to be rewritten to respect and realize our rights. Those are the five commitments. Now we've added some more. Here's the some more languages, indigenous languages, the revitalization, the recovery of our languages. We need to make progress on the revitalization and the recovery of our original languages, our indigenous languages, the languages that define our nationhood. They shape our thoughts and ideas. They're connected to ceremony. Ceremony is languages, language is ceremony. They describe our relationship to the world and our worldview. Everything around us, how we see each other, everything that is sacred. Our languages are linked, and I've said this before, the right to self-determination. The five elements we need for that right to be recognized as indigenous peoples, not only nationally, but internationally. And as indigenous peoples, we have those five things. We do have our own languages. We do have our own lands. We do have our own laws. We do have our own identifiable peoples. And we do, we do have our own identifiable forms of government. The five elements for that inherent right to be recognized, not only nationally, but internationally, globally. So language is so fundamental to our being as indigenous peoples. It's, it's who we are. And so we need to move now the self-determination 
We can't lose those languages. And we are taught by our old people, our elders, our knowledge keepers, that we have to use what was given to us by the Creator. I've said ceremony is language, and language is ceremony. And we have to let go of the myth in the most respectful way that Canada was founded on two founding nations, only English and French. We're using English now. It's a beautiful language. Mais oui, je parle français un petit peu, mes amis. Bienvenue tout le monde. Tu es très important dans mes yeux, oui. Beautiful language. But again, English and French. There are over 58 indigenous nations in Canada. And we know we all had a big role to play when we opened up the lands and the territories to our new newcomers and new relatives to Turtle Island. So in the most respectful way, we say, we challenge that myth. And we say, no longer should our languages be in the shadow of English and French. No longer should they be in the back seat. We want to put them up front. Because even studies have shown that when a young First Nations person is fluent in their language, they're more successful in school and therefore more successful in life. And that's really key to providing hope for the future. I also want to say, we know that many of them, there's not many speakers left on some of these languages. We don't want to see anything disappear, and we're going to say that's not going to be allowed to happen. That cannot be allowed to happen. And in some cases, we know where languages with just a few speakers are being turned around. So there is hope. I sat in on the languages session yesterday, and a lady from Alberta said that. Chief, try to provide more hope. It's always doom and gloom everybody talks about all the time. And that has an impact on our little ones. When you provide more hope that it can turn around, you might have a few language people that are fluent, but that can be turned around using the right approach, the master-apprentice model, capturing it so it can be taught again and re brought back. And so there is hope because in some instances, it's turning around. So it is getting stronger. It is getting better. But we need more work and more investments and more energy in that regard. Now, support for the re language recovery revitalization is key. And that's why we must begin to work to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action to establish indigenous languages legislation. Even talk about an institution, a languages commissioner. Work that must be driven and guided by First Nations priorities and expertise which is why we brought back the Chiefs Committee on Languages. And yes, we've got to work with the Chiefs Committee on Education because there's linkages between education and the Chiefs Committee on Languages. We can get that work done. The year ahead will be a busy one for all of us. The needs are great. The desire for change is huge. And I share with you the desire to accomplish more, faster. And next year, this country will be focused on celebrations, celebrating 150 years the sesquicentennial for Canada. And people everywhere ask me, what do we as indigenous peoples have to celebrate? What do we have to celebrate? Everything that we talk about when we look at it, the oppression, the poor housing, the high youth suicides, the disproportionate number of our people in jails. And I say it this way, that in spite of the genocide from the residential school system, that in spite of the colonization, the control of the Indian Act, and everything that we have endured as indigenous peoples, we are still here. And we are getting stronger. And we are getting louder. And we're getting healthier. And it's providing more hope. We can still hear our languages being spoken. We're still going to ceremonies, pipe ceremonies this morning, the water ceremonies, our sun dances, our pot latches all of our ceremonies that connect us to the land and to the Creator. And we're beginning to design processes to move beyond the Indian Act. That's hope. And we still live true to our worldview. So in closing, I want to thank all of you for journeying to be here. And we have a packed agenda over the next few days. We have the Prime Minister. We have Minister Jolie today. We have Minister Bennett tomorrow. We have Minister Hychuk. Um, yeah, I'm a Hychuk. ESDC. Yeah, skills and trades, important, coming. They're coming. They're going to join us. And I also want to say 
we can only do this work together. Our AFN tent is big for everyone. Everybody has a role. We want to listen to the youth, the elders, the women, no question. We have a long way to go. We need your ideas. We invite your participation and your direction. I want to say this, that our work will always be guided by the seven natural laws. And El Chief Elder, Elder Elmer, I'm going to say those teachings here as well. We're always guided by those seven teachings, those seven laws. And I say them with truth and honesty, with love and respect, with wisdom, with courage and humility, that will always guide our dialogue as chiefs, as AFN regional chiefs, as national chiefs, as friends and relatives, that will guide us. And in closing this worldview, and this is my last point, and I've said this many times across Canada to different forums, to chambers of commerce, to boards of trade, to rotary clubs, to university groups. Our worldview as indigenous peoples is simple. It's like when we go to ceremony, we don't see color, we say that way. We don't see color because we say we'll acknowledge everyone as a two-legged tribe. And when we go to ceremony, our worldview is we acknowledge our creator. And we always take the time to acknowledge those beings that sit in the east, in the south, the west, the north. We take time to acknowledge the gifts from Mother Earth, Father Sky, Grandmother Moon, Grandfather Sun. We will acknowledge the male plants and the female plants. Then we'll also acknowledge our brothers and sisters and relatives, the four-legged ones. And we'll acknowledge the flyers, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, the ones that crawl. And then most importantly as well, we acknowledge those four grandmothers, those four grandmothers that look after the waters, the rainwater, the fresh water, the salt water, and then the power of women when life comes, when that water breaks. That's our worldview. And if we as indigenous peoples, all peoples, can embrace that teaching, that worldview, and incorporate that into federal government planning, provincial government planning, business planning, we will see a difference. And we'll start singing what a wonderful world this would be. So my friends and relatives, we have much work to do. Let's put our hearts and energy and strength together and provide hope for our little ones. Hi, hi.